thank you everyone for coming. Um, yeah, so this is a panel on gender identity and sexuality, uh, so the different values between the two and sort of how either one and both sort of intersect with the world of advertising. Um, we've got an amazing panel. Uh, so down the end we have Jordan uh, from Hi. Rankin Creative. Um, we've got Julia from Gay Times. We've got Danielle St. James from Not A Phase. And we've got Giselle from Channel 4. Um, I'm Jax, um, I'm moderating today. I'm an advertising account handler um, and sort of DE&I advocate-y kind of person. Um, but I'll let sort of each of the panelists introduce themselves. Um, I think we've also been asked to describe um, for uh, the visually impaired what we are wearing today. Um, no one can fact check us, but I'm going to choose to be honest. Um, I am wearing a, I guess you'd say, sort of khaki dress. Um, and my hair looks as good as it could after a train down from Margate. Um, and so I'll start with Jordan, what's name, pronouns, a bit about yourself and obviously what you're wearing. Cool. Uh, my name's Jordan. I'm a writer, director and photographer. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. And I'm wearing all black, black boots, black shorts and black tank top. Over to you. Hello, I'm Jules. I work at Gay Times. I'm a creative director. I am wearing a black tank top. A leopard print shirt, jeans and white boots. And I'm excited to be here. Hey, I'm Danny St. James. I'm chief exec at Not A Phase. And I also own an underwear brand for trans people. I'm wearing all black also. Me and Jord Jordan pre-coordinated. Um, I've got a black shirt, black shorts, black sandals. Hi, I'm Giselle. I work at Channel 4. I specialise in branded content, um, so in the 4 Studio team, which is a new team that's been set up there. Today, um, weekday basically spat on me. I am in a white denim skirt. I've got a weird top that also has a hood um, and some sleeves. And I've got um, your house, Real Housewives of Clapton uh, Salomon XT6 <laughs> trainers on. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, I'm realising I forgot to introduce myself with my pronouns as well, but in case that wasn't abundantly clear from the outfit, my pronouns are they them. Um, so let's uh, dive into it. Um, the first thing we're talking about is uh, obviously sort of gender identity and sexuality. It's sort of historically something that advertising hasn't really sort of intersected with, kind of dove right in at the sort of sexuality side of it, in large part, the sort of white cis gay men is sort of gradually sort of intersecting with a bit more of the sort of the spectrum. So I guess first question, fairly general one, how can advertising campaigns best represent and engage with diverse gender identities and sexualities while staying authentic and respectful? I'm going to start with Jules, no pressure. Thanks, love being first, no pressure indeed. Um... I think people can include communities whether they're doing a queer campaign or not and making sure that everyone involved has a voice. They're not just being told what to say. They're being asked how they feel on set, um, making sure they're happy with what's going to happen on the day, making sure they're not being forced to wear an outfit or have hair and makeup that doesn't make them feel authentic to themselves, that kind of thing. Um, Jordan, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I completely agree with you. And I think, uh, really, it starts it starts behind the camera. It starts um, at the kind of, like, very uh, ideation stage. So if you're um, creating any type of, like, campaign or any type of project that either features LGBTQIA plus people or is for the community, I think you, um, whoever is in the room creating that project or kind of at the start of that ideation phase, you need to under... I think, first of all, you need to understand the community and, and like, um, who they are and what they stand for and the things that mean something to them. But also, you need to bring those people into the room to help you um, create that idea as as well. Because as, as we've seen time and time again, there are so many campaigns that are marketed to our community that are made by people not from our community, and often they they miss or they get something. And a lot of the time, they could be something that's actually really good and really useful um, for the community, but they they miss so wildly because they're not listening to people like from our side of the tracks, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, I guess um, the only thing really to add to that is I think the the best way of inclusion when we're talking about queer people now is to just move away from the tropes that we've all seen time and time again. We exist outside of the ballroom and the sequins and the ga 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 bow. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Some of us do. Yes, yeah, some of us do. <laughs> and I just think it's time to look towards um, normalising conversations by showing diverse people in all aspects of life rather than just nightlife. I think that's going to lead very neatly onto the next question that I'm going to throw to Giselle. Um, do you think advertising can play a role in challenging the sort of traditional gender norms and the, I guess the stereotypes that we're expected to, we are used to seeing of queer people and, and queer identity? Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, what you, who, who you see on your screen is, that's going to have like a massive impact on um, how you view society and different representation within those communities as well. You know, we need to ensure that we're really show, showing a wide breadth of different family makeups and, you know, things that you wouldn't uh, have seen like uh, so many years ago. You know, we're in a space now where we can actually support that and, and put it to the front as well. Um, I'd like to add as well, I think advertising is kind of responsible for these stereotypes and all these modern constructs of homophobia, transphobia, etc. Advertising has created it, so I feel like we're sort of responsible to undo it as well, undo that damage, and that's definitely something I'm trying to do in the work that I do, uh, make it better again, make it right. And I think as well, like on that, I think advertising, I think for me, the best advertising challenges us as, as an audience and I think um, the best advertising should push its audience to think of things in different ways or show different communities so um, yeah I completely agree agree with you both and I think advertising can do a lot to um, change the way people think and lead to a lot of uh, behavioral change as well. Um, and I also think like working with brands like you have the opportunity to be able to like push them to to do that as well like we received a campaign um, a brief from visit britain and it wasn't a particularly like uh, the in the objectives it wasn't necessarily about it being diverse but we went back to them with this idea called mission accessible which has um rosie jones in it who is amazing like she's an amazing comedian she's so great but thinking about like intersectionality like she has cerebral palsy and is gay and it's like we we said to we want to do a format we want to like put her as the star of the show and um as a whole format about accessibility and you know they were super open to it and they're like actually yeah like we want to do this and i think we have a responsibility as creators to be able to open that up and a lot of like brands actually do want to do it and have the appetite to do that if we kind of make those moves fantastic um, if we're all agreed then that advertising can, and it sounds like should play a role in sort of pushing on those uh, gender norms and stereotypes, how can advertising, how would we like to see advertising promote a more inclusive society? I'm going to come to you first, Danny. Um, I mean, I guess it's just adding on to, to what I said to the question a minute ago in terms of like how, how can they do this? Is it... it, it is it's moving away from stereotypes again sorry to repeat myself but in, uh, uh, like I want to get to a place where there's like a trans woman in the Tesco advert scanning oranges and it's not it's not a rainbow campaign it's just a campaign that happens to include diverse people of all backgrounds you know um, so yeah I mean I, th I, th I think the, the thing is with advertising and media in general is it's is it's conversation starter and when we talk about how um, you know, how gay, especially gay men, have seen liberation over the last 30 years. A lot of that has come from media, specifically creating conversations that normalises identities. And I think there's still so much further to go with that. But the first step is brands being a bit brave in the way that they advertise. Yeah, it's definitely about normalising all sorts of people. Um, you can see we're all normal here and we're queer. Um, How do you? <laughs> well, we're also divas, but, you know. Um, I forgot what I was going to say is my next point. 
but yeah. But I'll chime in because I because again I, I agree with both of you. I think it comes from a place of authenticity as well. It's about having authentic queer people in those marketing campaigns or advertising, just like you um, spoke of, Danny. Um, but not making, I guess, a quote unquote thing about them being. It's not about like it's a, a trans person being in a Tesco ad. They are just another person in a Tesco ad. Um, you said Tesco, right? I was yeah. the same series. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> either work. Either either ones. Either work. Um, but yeah, and I, I really think it's about like um, finding those diverse voices and those diverse communities and, and placing them in normal everyday situations. And also kind of to use an example of um, like um, Danny's uh, charity, Not A Phase, we did a campaign earlier this year. And one of the most amazing things about that, um, like when, when I first heard about what we wanted to do, it was showcasing trans people who live he healthy, happy lives, like healthy, quote unquote, normal lives. And I think that's a really important thing that we don't see enough of in the media or in advertising queer people just living their lives and being happy and being content yeah that's that, that's a really important message that came out of the campaign that we did um it was self-titled it was called this is not a phase which obviously is multi-meaning in the way we in the way we did it but it all came from alex and i we ran the charity together and um it, it, that campaign started off because we originally, when we, ke when we came to the idea of, okay, we're going to do something national, we instinctively went to the usual, okay, we need to talk about hate crime, we need to talk about the statistics, about, you know, you name it, we were going to go for the horror show that we're so used to seeing when we're talking about marginalized people. And then um, kind of looked inwards and realized that our responsibility as a charity is to show people thriving and, to, and overcoming all of those statistics that everybody promotes so, so much. And um, yeah, Jordan helped us, do it, helped us do that massively. And we just put loads of trans people smiling all over train stations and bus stops all over the country. And it was really effective. It was like, because nobody else is doing that. Sorry, just one more point on that. I agree with everything that you've said. Um, but also, just thinking about the actual, like, media that you're putting out there, like, especially for, like, tar now targeting, like, digital native people, like, you know, they're really turned on to advertising. And, like, if we can do more things within, like, a branded content space, like, we can actually, like, build more meaningful connections with them and actually able to, like, do storytelling or do more entertainment formats. And, like, I think both of them kind of work together like if we put like the lgbtq community in both of them and and show the stories as well as like in an entertaining light then um you know we're really like doing our jobs then oh and can i add one more thing of course <laughs> um I think it's also down to um, not just the creators, but also audiences to question everything that they're seeing as well. Because I think one of the things that I realized, um, and actually it was quite recently, and it was around the time we did that campaign actually, was um, a lot of the, the narratives that you see either in like feature films, in entertainment, TV shows, or advertising, a lot of the stuff about the queer experience is very much the same story, and it's some type of queer tragedy. It's either the kind of like, you know, gay angst narrative, something about coming out, something about non-acceptance from parents or, you know, like um, like uh, LGBTQ homelessness or all of those types of things. But we, we really don't often see queer narratives that end in some type of like happy scenario. Which, and even though I fucking hate rom-coms, um, is actually really nice to see some romantic comedies being made for, like, you know, gay people or queer people or that type of thing. And I think that that shift is actually really interesting. But again, I kind of put that to the audience. And sorry, I don't just mean you guys. I mean, like, us too. I think anyone who's, like, viewing and engaging with this content as to questioning, why do I kind of consistently see kind of the, the gay tragedy or the queer tragedy? Why do I consistently see these kind of, like, negative... Or um, these portrayals that end in a really like negative fashion. So I think we all kind of have a responsibility to engage with and react to what we see in, in a certain way and um, try and change that narrative as a society as a whole. Not to make it too deep. <laughs> it's going to get deep. We're talking gender identity and sexuality. We, we started out deep. Um, it's interesting that you bring up audiences because I think uh, it feels, especially in recent years, like brands are quite wary of audiences and how audiences will respond to their campaigns if they go out with queer inclusive comms and, and especially targeting specific uh, intersections of the queer community. Um, obviously, we've seen sort of pushback from the sort of the Budweiser's, the targets of the world sort 
of anyone working with Dylan Mulvaney. Um, and obviously no brand wants to be the, the next sort of Pepsi, Kendall Jenner commercial. So I guess sort of what, what are the, the pitfalls that brands and advertisers do need to be aware of if they are going to sort of actively go out and, and target a section of our community? I'm going to start with Giselle because I stole her mic for so long. Oh, thank you. Um, no, I think you're right. Like, you know, there's so many different intersectionalities within it and um, we need to be really just educating ourselves on everything that we put out and there's like an unlimited amount to learn about it like we always need to be like constantly learning um and i also think it's about like taking ownership for th like, if there are mishaps and things like that like what are you doing as a business to then to change that or to better that um and to really kind of you just start the conversation and, and do what you can because I think as long as you're like are you partnering with different organizations are you doing any mentoring or anything like that to kind of have that authenticity from the start then you can kind of like go around it yeah I completely agree I <clears throat> this year has actually been um the first year in about five years where I haven't had any brand work come through as an individual, which I know sounds really wow. like, oh, poor me. But work Pride Month, annoyingly, for, both for the charity and me as an individual, is like where you generate all your income. Um, and yeah, it's frustrating, but we all rely on Rainbow Month. Thankfully, as a charity, we did all right this year, but as an individual, I really noticed the difference. And I think it is, you know, you mentioned Dylan doing the Budweiser campaign. Um, it scared brands and what the problem with that is is when brands don't take any action like we just remain paused in all fronts um and how can they do it more effectively i think it all starts with as you say the education of the teams behind it first and also i think a brand really has to question why am i doing this campaign and if it's a money maker probably not the right campaign for you if what you want to do is really add to the conversation great but back it up and follow through there's brands that i have seen over the last year where they've done it wrong got backlash from one side or the other and then just completely withdrawn it that is worse than not doing anything in the first place i think you have to do it, educate yourselves, do it right, and back up your comms teams and be prepared for, annoyingly, what is always going to be a backlash. Yeah, absolutely. And having a, a duty of care plan in place afterwards. Um, and actually, something you said yesterday, Danny, in another panel you gave was um, making sure that people at the top know what they're talking about, why they're doing something, and if they don't, then put someone in place that does know that. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I, I, yeah, all three of you nailed it. No, nothing, nothing from me on this one. Yeah, I think as uh, an advertising account handler, I've unfortunately had that experience of sort of selling in trans talent to sort of the, the queer brand manager, the queer corporate comms manager, the queer social media manager, and everyone who needs to sign it off. But if they don't have that support at the sort of higher levels, then when they inevitably get the backlash, which you prepare them for as a queer person in an agency, and, and you hope that they've sort of got a plan in place for, if it has to be run up the, the flagpole at their end and no one higher up in the organisation has the education or the confidence to back up what they've, the stance that they've taken supporting a trans person, then I absolutely agree with you, Danny, that it's just more damaging than if they hadn't done anything at all. Oh, actually, sorry. One thing I do, do think on that as well, though, is um, I think it really starts with honesty as well. And um, I remember we did a, a brand piece for Pride uh, for one of our accounts that we had last year. And um, it was it came from two white men, two straight white men in their organization. And um, I was thankfully on it really early on, but um, I was brutally honest with them about everything. And I was like, you do realize you are going to get some type of backlash from this. You are going to have to support your talent. And I think you just have to be really honest with everyone involved really early on, um, which I can do a bit more as like a director or a photographer because I can be a bit more punchy with it. But when things get to like agency side and everyone starts talking around the problem, you really do have to kind of cut through all the bullshit and just go, this is not like, it's not going to be pleasant for certain things. But I think our job creatively is to take brands by the hand and go, we will guide you through this, but you are going to, you are going to be uncomfortable throughout parts of this process. I would just add to that, you're, you're so right, but in, in terms of the uncomfortability, 
there's a big education piece with uncomfortability, I think, as well, because I think um, active allyship is always going to be uncomfortable because you are, you know, you're acting from a point of empathy. If you're being empathetic to community, you're feeling a tiny part of the uncomfortability that we feel the whole year round. And so it should feel uncomfortable when you're doing something radical. It should be. Yeah, absolutely. It feels like uh, a lot of brands are comfortable taking brave steps sometimes and then when it's sort of, yeah, like, exactly like you say, on behalf of a community that maybe they don't yet have the, the necessary empathy with or understanding for, then they're just not really sure what to do with that backlash when it comes, right? Yeah. Uh, I think one of the things um, as well, just sorry, on that point before we move on, is um, uh, the one thing that I really enjoy saying to brands who want to kind of play in the LGBTQ arena is I always say that, like, you're a guest here. You're not, you're not part of the community. You may have people who work for your brand who are part of the community, but you, you don't get to, like, you know, charge so much money for a Pride T-shirt and then fuck off. It's like you, you, you are a guest in this arena and you need to behave as such. And I think when you say that to brands, they start listening slightly differently and they start understanding the weight of the problem. Oh, my God, I've got something else to add. Sorry, I'm so chatty today. Sorry, I've only um, got you for half an hour to go off. I know, sorry. <laughs> I, on the note of just doing a Pride t-shirt and fucking off, um, a big point that I raise is when it comes to brands, which is obviously marketing, it's all somewhat salesy anyway. Um, what you said about aligning with an organisation is so important. It's a huge part of our job at, at the charity. And we are there to help educate the brand whilst working with us. But in turn, the companies that are doing these campaigns, if they're donating less than 20%, this is for them, not for us. I personally, and not just because, obviously, of the charity, if, if anybody's working with any charity or cause, it should be 50%. It should be more. It should, what, why do you need it? Why do you, why do you need the more money from this, you know? The, there is never, it's never been harder for charities and grassroots organisations to raise money than it is right now. And so if a company wants to virtue signal, cough up. Oh, yeah, I agree. Sorry, one more point on this. And I totally agree with you because also I don't think that any type of Pride merchandise or Pride campaign, for me, look, I, I, don't, I don't own, like, a brand, but I'm also, like, the, that money... You don't need the money at Pride. There are, the whole reason you do those things is to, one, raise awareness of the issues that the community goes through, but also to, I guess, as you said, support the grassroots organizations. This is why, like, a few years ago, I always hold, like, Levi up as, like, the, the queer standard because they donated 100% of their profits to charity. And I was like, that's really, that's really cool and that's really amazing. And then when you get, you know, a, another brand donating like five, ten, or whatever percent. Or nothing. Ex ex or, or nothing. Or like Stella one... McCartney. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that becomes a problem, and that, become, that becomes a massive issue, because then that is... I don't even want to say... There's no type of allyship there, for me at least, anyway. Yeah, I think I'm going to come to our, our sort of former media person next to sort of ask the next question. But I think there's there's sort of uh, almost two sides of it. There's sort of how brands bring in their money. And then also one of the things that I feel doesn't get quite talked about enough in the world of advertising is how brands are spending their money. Like, obviously, I think we can all sort of probably list off the top of our heads a, a number of organization, media organisations <laughs> that are... <laughs> probably overrepresented in uh, the way that they purport narratives that are dangerous to our community. But with your main priority is the bottom line and those organisations like, oh, I don't know, the Times or The Telegraph or The Sun or literally all of them, um, are going to help you reach your audience. A lot of sort of brands will still spend out large with those with those media organisations. So I guess sort of, yeah, how can how can brands take steps to make sure that sort of through the line and, and when they're approaching things like media as well as not just sort of putting people in the ads that, that they can be inclusive as well? Yeah. Um, I think, so... Before I was at Channel 4, I actually chaired the Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging initiative at my previous workplace. And we kind of had some, like, core things that we would, like, expect for, like, partners that we would work with. Um, and I think you kind of need to set up, like, what is it exactly that you want to do and have a clear mission, you know? Do you want, like, key things are, like, embracing diversity, obviously, but then, like... Um, 
empowering people to come to work to be their authentic selves, um, educating like, everyone in the workplace about matters of equality, and also engaging with wider communities, like what are you doing to like get, put, put, give back. Um, I also think like things like recruitment, like recruitment biases need to be addressed. Um, and also there's so many different things that you can do, like have company charters, you can, um, even look to look at your what your company makeup is do like a proper report and like these things take time but like you know you need to be set up properly to be able to you know if you want to walk the walk if you is that right if you want to walk the walk you know, if you want to talk the talk you need to be able to walk the walk first mm -hmm. so you know you need to be set up properly before you can then even like start engaging with that and then obviously then that gives you the credibility to be able to do it but you need to make sure you, you're putting in the work you're giving back and you are speaking to um, organizations the other thing is um, that I thought about earlier when you guys were speaking was um, we kind of fostered this whole um, culture around um, so we didn't say calling out but calling in and it's really like leaning into that uncomfortability where like it was like a known thing in the workplace where you could openly call in things that people said and you know they had were to have an open mindset about it you know it's it's got you know yes it is uncomfortable to hear at times but you're you have like um, a responsibility to be able to like teach people if you have that knowledge Fabulous. Um, I'm conscious that we're about to lose Danny, to, and we'll open it up for questions as well. But I think we've been we've been confronting some of the harsh realities of uh, queer experiences in comms. I want to put a and it's not on the list, sorry. So a, a rogue question to the group: um, What is an example that you've seen of a, a brand or an advertiser doing it well? Starting with you, Danny. Doing it well. Okay. Um, I, um, there's a campaign that's been done twice by the same company at Starbucks and I'll tell uh, so a bit of a, of a, a shady story first of all <laughs> so um, I was in the running to be cast for the Starbucks call, your, you? yeah, call me by my name call your yeah. name uh, campaign and then I was cancelled because they said I didn't look trans enough which was not ideal uh, however when I saw that campaign if any of you haven't seen it Starbucks did a campaign about um, a trans person's name being called for the first time because it was written on the cup this is the Gemma and James one I'm not sure um, it was done in the UK first, and it was gorgeous. The advert was really, really gorgeous. However, they've just reissued it in India, and the Indian one is, like, moving. It's beautifully done, and it's, like, it's just perfect. It, I was really pleased to see the Starbucks campaign, and there's no bad blood because it did end up coming out really good, and I probably wouldn't have been right for it anyway. <laughs> Love it. Jules? Um, I'm going to just blow my own Gay Times horn here and talk about a campaign that we did for Skittles this year. And if you're in the King's Cross area, you'll see portraits of queer people. Um, it's an exhibition and the whole point of it was to be an antidote to all the hateful shit that's going on in newspapers. Um, the ones you mentioned <laughs> and others. Um, so... Yeah, we, and also to challenge stereotypes, being queer isn't being a white, cis, gay man. It's so many other things. It's see the rainbow, um, Skittles. Um, are the white, cis, gay men? No, Thanks. I'm not finished. <laughs> um, no, I'll blow the Gay Times uh, trumpet as well. Um, the the Coca-Cola campaign that we did um, for Pride this year, I actually thought was really uh, quite special because what they did was um, we did a photo shoot with four unsigned LGBTQ plus musicians um, and Coca-Cola uh, um, uh, traveling them around to different uh, festivals this summer. So really providing a launch pad for grassroots LGBTQ talent and um, yeah, uh, providing a springboard for, for their career. So I think um, initiatives like that are are really, really um, incredible because these musicians are getting an opportunity that they would not have got otherwise. Cool. 
Um, I'm also going to toot the Gay Times horn. Um, wow. but lots of, lots of Gay Times love today. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we did a collaboration with Voltarol, Channel 4 and Gay Times. And by the way, we, we love to partner with, like, as I said before, with, with other companies who like have the same viewpoints as you. Like, I think that's re it's really great to be able to do that, so always open for that. Um, but yeah, we did a campaign with Voltarol, which really challenged uh, your traditional view on gender norms. Um, it was focused, so um, Voltrol had actually teamed up with um, Pride Sport, um, and as part of this, they wanted to showcase, like, sport in the LGBTQ community, um, and um, the, it was a storytelling format. Um, it featured um, a female boxer who had previously not been allowed in, in those spaces, and she was um, in this specific gym, and it also included uh, a trans man, and it was just exposing their story. And then there was also articles on uh, Gay Times as well. Um, and so I just think it was a really like great campaign just to really like push and challenge your traditional gender norms. And these are the types of things that we need to be seeing more of. Yeah, and it was so successful. We're doing another one this year. Fantastic. So I think if you take away one thing from this panel, it's work with the Gay Times. Um, they're killing it. Um, I am afraid we're, we're losing one of our lovely panellists, but uh, before we open it up to questions, can I just get a huge round of applause for all four of our lovely panellists? Thank you. Um, we can now open it up to, to the floor. Um, if anyone has any questions, any burning questions about sort of gender identity, sexuality, queer experiences and, and advertising and comms. Yeah, shout out. Go for it. So I, I did the big day donation, I don't know if you saw that movie Which was... Oh, yes. Yeah, I did see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was really Simon. And it was basically um, four Um, so yeah, having this duty of care in place and being prepared for all of these different eventualities and standing by the work that you've put out there, maybe it's responding to people on Instagram or have, wherever the comments are saying, saying something back, but knowing what you're saying back as well. Um, sometimes deleting those comments that are really hateful. Um, and I guess in the case of Dylan, like they would, I don't know if you saw their latest, their Instagram, their video, and they've felt scared going outside their house. Like maybe it's like hiring somebody to protect them in that way, like a, a bodyguard. And um, that seems crazy actually saying that aloud. Yeah. But um, people are nuts out there. <laughs> and um, I, th I think the only thing I'd add to that is, uh, and this isn't really a piece of practical, I mean, it's kind of practical, but it, if you're booking those types of, of talent, um, I think you need to be really honest with them about what they're, what they're getting into, because you get a lot, and I'm not saying this is the case with Dylan, but I think you get a lot of people who um, don't, it's kind of like careful what you wish for because a lot of people get booked on these campaigns or, or go up for these campaigns and think oh man I'm going to get like this much money it's going to start my career I'll get like all these like uh, amazing opportunities from it but no one ever thinks about oh if I actually go south when like you know the right wing or whoever attack it no one thinks about 
oh, I might not be able to go to the shops anymore because like someone's going to try and point a gun to my head or any of those types of things. So I think you just have, a real, have to have a real honest conversation with them and go, I hope you understand what you're getting into. If you're going to be part of this campaign, there are these things. And, and it's unfortunate, and it's unfortunate we should even have to have that as part of the conversation, but I think you just need to kind of like have a bit of a reality check with them, not to put, it, not to put the onus on them, but just to make sure that they're super clear as to like what's going to happen. Because unfortunately, brands do leave LGBT Q plus creators high and dry a lot of the time so I think it's really it, as lovely as the brands can be on set or on the day I think you just need to make them aware there may come a time where it's just you on your own yeah. and I think part of the the answer is, is almost in your question like you you mentioned that you know the brands have all of this infrastructure in place and and sometimes these independent content creators or influencers won't and I think that's that's the thing that brands need to understand is that when it goes out from their platform that exposes this person whose network or whose whose audience reach was previous only people who chose to engage with them and so likely allies supporters other queer people you are choosing to give them a much bigger platform and you are exposing them to this risk. So when that risk comes back to them, it's your platform that the response needs to go out from. It's it's no good you replying privately to them or you putting out a, a statement sort of on your, like, the Twitter or the, the channel that it didn't go out on and that sort of thing. Um, so I think we're very used to seeing that sort of thing. And, and it would, I personally would love to see brands taking a bit more responsibility for the position that they're putting the, the talent in and then the power that they have to either stand by or just stay completely silent. Yeah. Very good question. I've just got one quick example from the, the Skittles campaign that we've put out and it's it's in King's Cross for three months and there's like millions of footfall there. We made the really difficult decision to not put everybody's, all the faces featured, not to put their social handle there so that if there was hate, it wasn't going to go directly to them. And instead, we put a QR code, so it's less easy to find and target these people. But then they do get the exposure by being on the Gay Times website and on our socials, but it's not so accessible for the general public, especially in the climate that we're in at the minute. Any other questions? Yes. Um, you talked about, um, I guess I'm thinking about those people who are higher up in companies and organisations who are kind of the eventual um, decision makers and tend to be the most risk averse. And we see so much, like the, the Bud campaign was huge, like it's huge, and now um, it's it's been a great conversation starter because I think in taking the posts down, we're now talking about like the damage that done in just taking campaigns down but we don't really talk about like the best practice and like the good examples and uh, like those decisions like well this campaign's really great because we didn't put the social handles and I wonder how like what advice you have for being able to advocate using those like good examples and also putting it in terms where like chief execs can understand it because of things like audience growth and economic Um, I was just going to say, uh, just a small thing, but um, just on like the chief executive thing, like, you know, they have a duty to be able to do the work and actually like list. So, you know, yeah, they're not going to be experts in it, but there's people around them that will be able to kind of help advise them and they should be like listening to that and, you know, be big enough to be able to let them people do that and to, to make those decisions. Just just in terms of the, the CEO bit that you mentioned, I'll pass over to you on the next one. Um, there is a statistic somewhere, I can't remember who it's by, but I think it's like there's a 65% increase in sales or popularity of a brand if they include LGBT or queer or marginalised people in their campaign. Yeah, you know I think I, I, I'm familiar with. I, you're looking to me like I can corroborate that statistic. Unfortunately, I've just heard it as well. Um, but yeah, I think. Uh, 
and when it comes to sort of the, the selling point, I guess, is, is this sort of question, like, to risk averse stakeholders, it's unfortunately a bit of a shame and a bit cynical, but you do end up relying on on some of those more uh, sort of commercial arguments rather than the this is the right thing to do sort of thing. I think one of the, the more compelling ones that we're starting to hear more recently is when you look at the sort of increasingly queer makeup of uh, new generations like Gen Z, all the sort of trend reports that are coming out about Gen Z is sort of how much more queer and more trans than they are and a lot of marketers even if they don't have a, a queer inclusion strategy will already have a Gen Z audience outreach strategy because they already understand that very soon this generation is going to have the buying power that your company is going to be sink or swim whether you appeal to them so I think it's those sorts of arguments and I think one of the the really interesting ones that I've started to hear more recently as well is uh, sort of talking about kind of trans inclusion and trans education in the workplace as you're also starting to hear sort of from parents of that generation that if they don't see that in their comms or if their workplaces aren't talking to them about it, then actually sometimes the first time they're having conversations about gender identity or what does non-binary mean or what does trans mean is when their kids who are Gen Z are coming to them and, and admitting something to them or wanting support with something and they're finding themselves unable and unarmed to answer those questions. So I think it's those sorts of pressures that we're starting to see optimistically from this new generation that are putting pressure both on brands and on organisations, whether they care or not, to sort of look at the bottom line, look at what actually matters to their customers and their employees and hopefully sort of be dragged kicking and screaming in the right direction. <laughs> yeah, I've got one more thing to add here is is Beyonce um, and I think anyone male pale and stale will see the power of Beyonce's renaissance tour and that album that tour everything to do with that is only possible thanks to the black trans community uh, in New York and all of that scene has now become renaissance and now mainstream so queer culture is culture queer culture creates culture and um yeah that's the power of including these people in your campaigns essentially love it i think the only other thing i'd add oh well, sorry we i do think we have time for one last question so i am gonna ask the lovely ashok for what score sorry I love that whenever I come to you for a question, Ashok, I get the evil capitalistic question. Um, yes, absolutely. I think uh, one of the other things that... Um, one of the other sort of compelling kind of uh, commercial arguments that I'm starting to see is when you look at sort of brands who have seen the most brand growth in sort of recent years, but also dating back as far as sort of when you look at kind of Nike jumping on... Uh, jogging as a, a habit where it wasn't really ingrained in society, you see that the most brand growth that you get, exponential rather than incremental, is from the margins. It's from these marginalised behaviours. It's seeing what other brands aren't doing, what audiences other brands aren't tapping into yet. And if you can be the brand that adopts it first and quickest and most authentically, then it's just untold the kind of uplift that you can see from that. So I think that's where you do see brands like Nike, like Budweiser or whatever, starting to take those tentative first steps and thinking, oh, hey, none of the rest of the category is doing this. Could we work with this influencer? So hopefully it's just that... Hopefully there are brands that already see the commercial benefit to that and the catch-up game that we're playing at the moment is just sort of getting them up to speed with how to do that authentically and, and in a way that benefits the community. I think that is all the time that we have and we're going to need to start clearing out this space um, for Dodgems and awards. Thanks, everyone. But yeah, can we get another round of applause for the, the lovely panel?